Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 13 of the Wired Nerdy podcast. My name is Keith. I am here, as always, with my sidekick and good friend, Doug. How you doing, buddy? Doing good. We have some really cool stuff to talk about today. First of all, the nerd news is really expansive and some really cool stuff to talk about. And then we're going to uh, take everyone on a journey with a a project that we worked on last weekend, which is kind of like what we did with the Comic Con. But this time it was a retro game collection uh, convention that we went to and we actually worked. So that'll be our main topic for today. But before we jump into all that coolness, let's queue up the nerd news. Nerd news. All right, Doug, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, found some uh, really interesting articles this week. Uh, we'll kind of work our way through them. The first thing that uh, caught my attention was Best Buy is set to close 20 or 30 stores. Now, as I uh, read the article, I believe that's uh, typically normal for a company to close a couple stores here and there. But it looks like their number is growing larger and larger every year. I kind of go back to the old days of Circuit City, if you remember that. Oh, I do. Uh, I believe that was pre-Best Buy, but I could be wrong. But a big electronic store just getting uh, d- devastated by other competition, online retailers. Yeah. I think uh, Best Buy is going the same way with uh, the likes of Amazon and other online retailers. And online retail from Best Buy, you know, just ship it straight to your house. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? So, yeah, Circuit City and Best Buy, um, both around the same time. Best Buy's been around a long time. Uh, you know, Best Buy's kind of nostalgic in the fact that when I was a kid, that was like the thing that me and my grandpa would do. Is that My grandfather was into computers, and I was into big box PC gaming at the time, more so than console. Uh, and uh, anytime I would spend time with them in the summer, I would go visit with them, you know, for weeks on end. That was our thing we did. We yeah. hit up every best buy that we could possibly find and uh, i would pick out a different uh, pc game and because he had a pc that could run it and i didn't <laughs> no. that's awesome um but yeah funny story uh, i actually got kicked out of a circuit city once uh oh, no <laughs> yes we so, gotta hear this story it was a long time ago uh so this is obviously before circuit city will went debunked uh, now circuit city was always a little bit more aggressive about their sales tactics uh for example they'd gotten in trouble for bait and switch tactics where they would show a television that would be on sale for X amount of dollars. You'd get into the store and they'd conveniently be like, oh, we don't have that one. But then they'd upsell you. So, but we got this one for $100 more, you know? And they got actually in trouble for that uh, before they went defunct and went bankrupt. Uh, oh, but man. I got in trouble because I was in their PC area. I was, I was a teenager and there was Uh-oh. an old lady and this sales guy was just telling her crap. She didn't, it was all lies. He, he was trying to upsell her and tell her, oh yeah, you need the most RAM, you need this. And she's like, I'm just checking email on it. And I interrupted and spoke up. Well, of course they work on commission. He went and told the manager and they escorted me out. And so, um, yeah, I ruined the guy's sale, but I wasn't going to let that little lady get ripped off. So absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) You uh, saved her big time. I did. So that's my, that's my circuit city memory there. But yeah, man, it's, it's no surprise that this is happening. I mean, this is the, this is the, the the trend that we're we're seeing, you know. And mm. Walmart is an interesting example. Obviously, Walmart is a behemoth uh, when it comes to uh, big box stores, but they're they've been trying for some time to leverage their online to be like Amazon. They've been trying to go toe to toe with Amazon for some time now. Um, obviously, they do other things like um, groceries and and things like that. Uh, so they are finding their niche, their way. Same for Target. Uh, Best Buy has kind of struggled with that. Um, I think the article, it mentioned they're, they're going to do, what were the stores called? Like concept stores or niche stores? What, what is it that they're outside yeah. of just closing these? Aren't they doing something different? Yeah, I think they're going to try, uh, they're opening eight smaller concepts and uh, I haven't read into that. I believe it's sure. kind of like the, uh, corner kiosks you see in malls and stuff like the mall we have here. Uh, just kind of their high end items, cell phones only stuff like that. And they may also look at their sales, see what actually sells in store versus online. Uh, and then, you know, maybe that's what they're doing, going after that. I will say I've had really good luck with Best Buy's online selling and then directly site to store and then obviously yeah. to home. I have as well. They got a, they've got a pretty solid uh, online model. I will say that when I was trying to get my PlayStation 5, I did I did get it from them. Um, No. 
I got that from Walmart. Uh, I had gotten a video card, I believe that was hard to get. Yeah. From Best Buy. Um, they did, they were getting overran. This is back when there were video card shortages and that sort of thing. Uh, but overall it's a decent online experience. Maybe they can just capitalize on that and not yeah. go way of Radio Shack. <laughs> so, yeah, Best Buy has been good for me. Um, I, I know I've told you this story. My first uh, Pixel that I ordered, the Pixel 4 XL, I shipped to Best Buy. They didn't have any in stock. But it was cool walking out with it and all the Best Buy staff literally gathered around. Oh, you've got one of those new Pixels. I, and I know the Pixels oh. have been out with the 3 and the the other yeah. ones. But that Pixel 4 XL was kind of their first really good adaptation of it, I believe. And it was yeah. cool to I, them to see. And I had the crazy color, like the yeah. bright fuchsia, orange, whatever. So what's it's memories like that that are nostalgic. I remember getting yeah. uh, an Xbox 360 from there. Like I remember standing in line before they opened and the line forming behind me and the rush to get in there and get a number. You know, it's just it's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, the store's been around a long time. So, you know, I don't I really hope that they, they don't completely close. It is nice to be able to go and grab a cable when you need it to. Absolutely. Uh, that's, yeah. you know, you don't want to wait even two days sometimes if you're working on something. So wish them luck. We'll see what happens there. So let's move on to the next one, brother. What do you, what, I'll let you grab this one as well. All right. Um, yeah, I was watching the news. Uh, I was really anxious, looking forward to it, but the SpaceX launch. So I'm sitting there watching the launch and then it explodes. But what caught my attention was no one was mad about it. Really. They said this was a huge learning lesson. Um, I guess a couple of the engines went out. Uh, there was a ton of engines on the bottom of this thing. Biggest rocket they've ever attempted to launch. And uh, just kind of a science experiment uh, launch for them. Yeah, this is unique because they've already proven that they can reuse shuttles, launch them, land them. Uh, but this one was unique because it is going to be the shuttle platform they use to send people and resources to the moon and Mars. And their goal was just because of the rockets being so big was just to get off the launch pad, which mm -hmm. they did. Now, this was yeah. never intended to reland. The intention of this one was to launch up and to it was going to crash into the Gulf of Mexico water anyway. It just it blew up too early. Yeah. But they considered it a win for the most part, simply because um, this one is different than their other launches because its long term purpose is to shuttle people and things. And I think there was a lot of concerns about just clearing you know, the launch pad, which they did. Um, so, it, you know, that's why people weren't upset if, if I'm reading it correctly. So, yeah. But it's interesting to see what they're doing in that, that space as well. It is exciting. And uh, not to get in deep, put your tinfoil hats on here for a minute, but uh, <laughs> the whole moon landing and stuff, it would be nice to see them go back again. I believe it happened in the beginning. I was say, I'm not you? saying that. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of You're those. You're not one of those, are you? The earth is but flat. I mean, <laughs> moon it'll be good happen. to yeah <laughs> it'll be good to show them again hey we're here it's real we're not lying you know and deep down inside doug can be like oh shoo. it did have <laughs> uh x files my bad no i'm giving you i'm giving you yeah. crap, so i'm excited for them to go back to the moon it, it would be really cool to see that yeah, it's 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 neat. Anything related to space exploration, I'm glad they're doing it again. When NASA stopped doing it, it was kind of a bummer. They got kind of some funding issues, some you know, a couple like a decade or so back. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool that I, it's now that it's privatized. It'll be interesting to 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 see where it's going. So, all right, next one. Not a popular one by any means. No. Netflix. Ooh, we mentioned this before in earlier shows, but uh, it looks like before July, which isn't as early as they thought, uh, but it's still happening. They're going to crack down on password sharing. Now, they already did this in other parts of the globe, like South America, kind of tweaking it. Um, a lot of this is revenue driven, and it's also for them to promote. They now have multiple tiers, meaning they have an ad uh, based tier that will probably move people to. Uh, I've seen a lot of jokes online about, you know, college kids that haven't gotten off their parents' Netflix account are going to have to drop down to the ad tier that Net yeah. Netflix is forcing them to it. So th this is controversial in the fact that they're a big company. They're making a lot of money, very popular. Um, so there's a lot of motives behind this. Like, what does it hurt? You know, like people are questioning what what is this outside of it being a money grab? Uh, and it does kind of feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, now, most streaming services, I think what worries me is depending on how they do this, and the way they go about it, 
you know, because they are the head of streaming. They're like the king of streaming right now. You know, the other services are going to follow suit depending on mm -hmm. what they do. That's what that's what worries me more. Um, personally, I think it should be device. It should be uh, consistent stream driven, meaning what does it matter if I yeah. share my password with somebody? If we're not watching at the same time, I think consecutive viewings are what matters. And yeah, if you have a family subscription, I have, you know, multiple Apple TVs in my house. Oftentimes we'll have multiple Netflix going at once. But the idea behind that is I have more than one streaming service. If somebody's watching Netflix, oftentimes I'll go watch Paramount Plus. Yeah. Um, that's my take on it is I don't get I don't like it. I, I do feel like it's a money grab. I think what they should be doing is cracking down more on multiple streams or geolocation, meaning that if you have one IP address in one part of the state that is streaming, I think this is what they may do. They can detect if the IP address is different than another. That's when they may crack down on it. Again, what does it matter? Uh, so yeah. that that's my take. I, I really wish they would stick with the model of concurrent streams, because if I'm only streaming once every now and then, who cares if it's, you know, somebody else that I gave it to you? It's not impacting you at all outside of you're not getting an, an additional plan service uh, element. So what are your thoughts on this, man? Yeah, my thoughts are the same thing. I mean, they're going to have to really look at their uh, geolocation and stuff like you said, because uh, how do you shut somebody down for supplying their kid, which I know you're in college, you're going to be an adult, but you have your IP address flagging at a university and then you have your IP address flagging at the registered address of the account holder. To me, that's justified. I mean, you're sharing it with your family. You still support your children and stuff. So that's kind of the only example I can come up with at the moment. But well, uh, how's it, what about watch parties? That's the thing now, yeah. right? You know, yeah. if you want to watch something with your kid, it's in college, for, to use your example. Like, they got to be on their own ad plan service just so that they can watch something with you remotely. Cause watch parties and remote viewings are things that bring people together. Now yes. that I know Amazon prime, there's a little button you can tap now and I can send an invite to you. We're in sync. We're watching at the same time. You know, Apple is doing that like with FaceTime. Like if you're watching a movie, they'll, it'll put your video, my video in the corner. And it's like, we're watching together. That's a cool mm -hmm. thing. What happens yeah, really to that? Cool. I'd say I, don't know if they're interested in it, I guess. Because, yeah, the student or the child has the ad service. You have the full maybe HD 4K service. So you're six, uh, oh, good point. six scenes think about ahead that. and they're stuck on an ad back here. You know, so. that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Well, like, how is it going to sink? I, I don't know. We'll see how it yeah. how it shakes out. I'm, I'm not a fan of what they're doing. I know a lot of people no, aren't. I, I'm now, not either. Maybe it'll be no big deal. You know, maybe maybe they'll have, um, you know, policies in place that really aren't that restrictive and people are making a bigger deal out of it than what it is. Yeah. We'll find out. So anyway, next one. <laughs> this one's fun. <laughs> so at Disneyland in Anaheim, the Maleficent dragon engulfed in flames after the Fantasmic show goes wrong. And I love all of the <laughs> the comments. People are like, you know, don't mess with Mickey. You know, right. <laughs> the one article on, uh, I believe it was Polygon, said Mickey is much too powerful. He must be stopped. <laughs> the, they have uh, been but, good. I've been yeah. reading through a couple. Oh, they're good. So basically, it's an animatronic dragon. Uh, beautiful, as Disney is known for making these really cool elaborate set, set pieces, both at Disney World and Disneyland, Florida, and then, of course, California. Uh, and on this one, the pyro they were using is just the, the head caught on fire. I'll make sure I've got some really good footage that people had put up on different services that uh, will overlay on top of this. Um, but, you know, what's interesting, this uh, no one was hurt. That's that's really that, cool. That's this good. isn't the first time this happened. This happened in 2018 as well, according to the article. Uh, the same Maleficent dragon uh, had gone up in flames during the Festival of Fantasy Parade at Orlando's Magic Kingdom. So the other park, uh, the dragon was supposed to breathe fire during that parade, uh, but his head caught fire instead. This is the same thing that had uh, happened uh, just recently uh, in Anaheim. Uh, again, no injuries on that one. Uh, that one, it was on a float. Uh, the float eventually returned to the play parade where it was still breathing fire uh, until the effect was halted. And um, the, basically, they had to do fire in response. So this is a thing that is common. You know, they do a lot of pyro at all these parks. So bound to have something like this happen. Uh, it's interesting to see if they shuttle the whole thing or not. 
the the dragon definitely got damaged. You can tell by the footage because it was like it's just whole head just caught on fire. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny because it happened right at the time when Mickey was like shooting his little sparks at it. So it did look like Mickey jacked that dragon up, man. <laughs> that is awesome. And uh, kind of a side note, I was curious. Disneyland has had their own uh, fire department for over 25 years, I believe. That's cool. Yeah, they do. Or, they I'm do. sorry. I misquoted. The uh, current chief has had 25 years oh. of service with the uh, L.A. City Fire. Oh, okay. um, I see. Yep. I do not know how long Disneyland has had the fire department, but they've got their own fire station. Uh, they say it's one of the most trained, efficient, and rigorous fire response teams because you have so many people in such a tight area. And like you said, pyrotechnics and other stuff to worry about. Yep. Same for uh, security force. I mean, they're essentially a city, an entity unto itself. It's very, very impressive um, how they have everything set up there. Yep. Uh, so, but this, this was kind of an interesting one. The, the visual images, uh, of people with recording with their phone was kind of funny too. So yeah, <laughs> really cool. All right, brother. What's the next one we have on the list? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm going to let you yeah. take, take this one and then I'll, I'll add my two cents. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next article we're going to look at is AMD has released a new Ryzen 7,000, but, uh, some of them are burning out. Uh, as I'm looking at the photos here, I see a very mysterious bump that I don't believe is supposed to be there. <laughs> no, I believe they are uh, having some issues. Um, now, you're from the IT world. You've probably seen a lot more in the industry with this. But me, as just a guy who puts it in a computer, how, how would I be able to, I guess, as a non-super IT guy, be able to know, oh, no, I need to address this before it burns my whole computer down? Well, if it's getting to the point of what we're seeing in these images with the the bulging, it's too late, brother. Uh, oh, okay. At this point, your processor is toast, and it's an expensive processor, as well as yeah. your motherboard, motherboard most likely. Uh, so it's related to voltage issues. Now, this is rare. This doesn't happen a lot. Oftentimes, this is caught uh, whenever they're doing a lot of their, their testing within factories. Um, so... But if you rewind a little bit about what's happening here, um, essentially the voltage is getting too high. Now, a lot of these processors, this 7000 processor, it's impressive. But every time they do an increase in speed, they're having to tweak and adjust the voltage ratios. With this line, as well as some of the Intel lines, oftentimes chips will let you overclock, mean run it faster than what it's spec'd for. It's it's allowed to do that safely. And you can go in and actually tweak the voltage levels to get it to run faster. With this particular line, they're capping it. They will only let you overclock it with preset settings in the BIOS. Um, so what that means is there's a very thin margin of error when these things will start messing up. And oftentimes, if you're overclocking and running it too high voltage-wise, you'll get a blue screen if you're running Windows. It'll just lock up. Uh, mm -hmm. The way you'll know is that you'll probably smell it because it'll be burning. Your computer oh. will definitely stop working, uh, uh -oh. but your, your system is damaged at that point. Now, the good news is, is that the type of motherboard uh, that these chips run on is called an AM5 motherboard made by different manufacturers like, you know, Asus, Gigabyte, a um, whole bunch of them. Uh, there is a patch basically a firmware upgrade. It's not really a patch. It's a firmware upgrade for your BIOS. And all, what they're doing is they're able to, you know, fix that voltage to make sure that what's being sent power wise to the processor doesn't burn up. So it is highly recommended that if you are an early adopter into AMD, um, especially one of these 7000 series, uh, definitely flash your BIOS, get it fixed, or you're going to you're gonna have some issues. It is an impressive chip. Uh, if you look at how fast it is, it's it's awesome. It is so, so impressive. But yeah, you don't want to mess around. You spend that money on something, yeah, you, you don't want it burning up like that. So this is kind of a kind of a big deal and one of those things that, you know, if you're one of those early adopters or you bought a computer uh, that has one of these chips in it, definitely get your BIOS updated. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that advice there. Um, now, this may be a whole nother topic, but Intel versus AMD, do you have a preference? Is one stronger than the other? Or is it just kind of two friendly competitions? Does one so, have an advantage over the other, I guess? It depends on what you want. 
I'm going to I'm, I'm going to land on this like we did with the Apple and the Android. They I'm not a purist in that uh, or tribal, I should say, where I'm all one or all the other. I think each one has its place and does things very, very well. Hmm. Uh, traditionally, the, the advantage to them, th- there have been some longstanding things with them. So traditionally, AMD, uh, they are typically the processors cost a little less. Um, a and D gets very creative on how they gain performance with their technology. Uh, and it's usually a little cost a little bit less oftentimes. Uh, so you get a lot of bang for your buck with AMD. Hmm. Intel traditionally, uh, is the one that innovates oftentimes with the way that they achieve their speeds. They're the ones that will forge out and do things new. Now, not to say AMD hasn't done that, but usually Intel's the leader on, the development of new technology types. Now they get black eyes for it sometimes. Uh, you know, if they try something new, it doesn't work out. They're the ones doing it first. But then traditionally AMD, if it works, they'll copy them or do their own version of it. Oh, so okay. they have been doing this cat and mouse. So it, both of them are good because we win because it drives yeah. processor chips prices down. Uh, and they do this cat and mouse game oftentimes where you'll have like an i9, which is an Intel chip released, and then you'll have an equivalent but cheaper for AMD that runs a little bit better or just under it. So it really kind of depends. Now there are some, and you can't say it completely blanket, but I will say historically, there are some things you do need to be aware of. So if anybody asks me, well, which one do I want to do? One depends on your budget, depends on what you're doing. Are you gaming? Are you, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the end of the day, my experience has been oftentimes AMDs will run hotter anyway. Coincidentally, having this article with the burning up, they just run warmer all that means that's not a bad thing necessarily it just means you have to be extra sure that in your computer case you have proper cooling fans whether you're gonna do liquid cooling you want to go the extra mile on you don't want to skimp out on your fans you want to you want to make sure you have a good ventilation for what we call your thermals uh, okay. on amd especially intel's a little bit more you know sensitive about that now amd you can overclock them um now Intel does have a K series line that you can't overclock, but AMD, they have a history of overclocking. AMD will let you push their processors a little further than Intel. So again, you can squeeze more performance out of them. So it's kind of this back and forth, depends on what you want to do kind of a thing. Um, But it's just little things that you need to be aware of. I lean towards Intel only because of stability. Now, I'm not saying AMD isn't stable. It's just that I don't want to have to worry about my heat, my thermals, um, and I'm in a very small office area. I don't have great ventilation sometime. So I stick with Intel only because it does cost a little bit more money, but there's stability there. Um, and I just I don't want to mess around with it. Now, in my younger yeah. days, I was all in on AMD because I overclocked them bad boys. I tweak them, play with them. I'm at that point, especially in my age and career. I don't have time to mess around with these kind of things. So I'm going to lean towards the stable. It's why, honestly, Doug, is why I choose Apple over Android. Android does infinitely more things than Apple. They give you more choice, more power, more freedom. It's incredible. I'm so impressed with it. However, with freedom and choice, same for AMD, sometimes come some headaches when it comes to stability or other compatibility issues. I don't want compatibility. I don't want to troubleshoot. Like I want stability. So that's why I lean towards Apple. Uh, when sense. it comes to choice of phone. It, so it's the same thing. So one's not bad over the other. It's more about what you want and understanding the differences between the two. Traditionally, they're both amazing, good competition, long grant, but it's a complicated issue. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The next one. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do this next one as well. Oh, man. I've got all the good articles this week. Um, I know. 3D printers. Have you ever messed with a 3D printer? I have not. Uh, my brother's really into them. He's very, he does a lot with them. Very, very talented. Um, <laughs> but this is the 3D printer I could probably get behind. <laughs> now it's this, unique. when I first read it, it reminded me of, and uh, I'll let you say the name because I'm going to get it wrong, but the food replicator or what is it called on Star Trek? Oh, yeah. You got it right. It's it's the replicators. It's the food replicator. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, you nailed it. So, yeah, there's a new 3D printer out that creates delicious uh, chocolate models. Um, the Cocoa Press, I believe it's what they're calling it. That's correct. I found what's unique about this is that not only does it make cool chocolate that's edible, that's neat. Um, Hershey's been doing this for a while now. If you ever went to um, Las Vegas, for example, there's a Hershey store and you can actually have them 
do custom chocolate printing. So this has been a thing, but oh. this makes it to where you can do it in your home. What I found fascinating is, is that the Cocoa Press is available. Uh, you can reserve it now from the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but the full price will be $1,500 for a kit. And this is where you save money. Fifteen hundred bucks. However, to get the thing working, you have to three D print parts for yourself to build it. Oh man! If you don't want to do that, it's four thousand dollars for a fully assembled kit, which will ship later in the year. To me, it isn't just not only is the chocolate thing being able to do that in your home and and that sort of stuff kind of cool, but think about like Etsy shops, people being able to, um, you know, take and make custom chocolates and ship them to you as long yeah. as they don't melt. But I haven't heard of a company saying, hey, we'll sell this to you at a discount, but you got to make your own parts. You got to 3D print your own parts. I thought that was That is different. Yeah. Now, maybe, and I don't know if this is right, someone already with a 3D printer can 3D print the parts needed for this uh, Cocoa Press. I think so. I believe so. You would have to have a, a standard 3D printer that does, you know, plastics and that sort of thing, probably to print these parts out. So mm. you'd have to be pretty into this if you're going to take that one kit because you're going to need to print it on another device in order to yeah. get this thing working but it's an interesting article to, to say the least absolutely um, yeah then the next one i'm going to skip over the one that you entered there uh but uh i'm going to skip on into steam did an update that's that's our yeah. next one we're going to talk about sounds uh, good so they did a uh, it's unique they did a user interface um change with steam which where you purchase video games from but they added features that no one really thought about before. It's unique. Specifically, they added a notepad feature inside of Steam. Now, what's cool about it, it overlays on top of your game, and you can type notes. Um, you mentioned this is really good for like streamers. I like it because there's certain types of games that are so overwhelming. Like one game in particular that I play all the time. Now, I play it on PlayStation, but I also have it on PC, is No Man's Sky. And in that game you're having to craft things and you have to remember, okay, I need to make this part. I'm going to need uh, chromatic copper. I'm going to need iridium and I'm going to need, you know, recipes. And yeah. I'm always finding myself going into the, the, the menu system to say, okay, what was it? I need to make this. If I had this on the overlay, I could type my notes and then it overlays. Yeah. It's so cool. Or, you know, what part of the map, you, you know, things are. So I think it's a cool idea. It's yeah. kind of a neat, neat twist on things. What are your thoughts on it, man? Yeah, same thing. I mean, it's going to be very helpful, especially for those uh, solo RPGs and those games where you're just grinding, grinding, grinding and getting all the uh, parts and ingredients and stuff you need. I like it. Keep now, the other things. Yeah. The other thing I thought about is like fighting games like Mortal Kombat. Say you put uh, like Fireball up there. So it's down uh, right, left. Uh, yeah. So the uh, possibilities are endless. Uh, That's a great idea. One of the funniest examples here is just a to-do list. Kill bad guys, get their loot, sell their loot, <laughs> don't die. <laughs> I mean, yeah. kind of. And now it's a motivational poster for you as you play your game. There you go. I like it. I like it. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, I'll let you take the next one. It's about a new television series coming down the way. Yeah, I'm really excited. So back in the good old days of PlayStation 1, then I went to 2 and 3 and 4, was the series called Twisted Metal. So for those that don't know, Twisted Metal is a car. It's not really a car racing series. It's more car like combat. a demolition. Yeah, demolition derby with missile launchers and all kinds of cool stuff. So the main antagonist or the main character is a ice cream truck with a guy in a clown <laughs> outfit called Sweet Tooth. Um, the generation of that sweet was his name. yeah <laughs> see i'm giving you i know some knowledge about this a little bit <laughs> you are you are but so uh, I gave it to you. yeah sweet tooth uh is kind of the main guy through all the different shows uh and looking at uh the stars i mean will arnett's gonna be in there um and i just had the list of others but some really good names um are gonna be in there so i'm excited for it I didn't, I played the game, but I wasn't, I wasn't heavy into it. Um, there wasn't much of a story, was there? If, I don't think there yeah. was. I, I mean, there was a story uh, in the game? There was. So this uh, oh, wow. guy, so I'm getting deep <laughs> I didn't here. know that. Oh, wow. <laughs> this uh, guy me. named Calypso, he uh, started this whole series and it was kind of a way, and I may be misquoted to kind of free your soul and get one ultimate wish. So all these characters you play have, have an ultimate wish, 
but Calypso would turn it in the end and trap you, or he'd give you your wish, but uh, it would be bad for you. Wow, kind of like the monkey's ball. So, yeah, interesting. Wow, never knew that. There was more of a story to that than I thought. I thought it was just yeah. car, really weird looking cars and demolition derby and combat. That's well, that's the main thing, and that's really cool. So it is really cool. You know, there's this run of uh game properties whether it's the last of us you know all of these like going to uh shows it's interesting how they're it's kind of like what we see in cinema where in the last you know 20 years they've been unearthing all the comic book ips in order to put out there it's like they're now doing that with video games it's it's kind yeah. of fascinating and they do that with novels too as well but huh i did not know this one was coming down the way so good find Yep, I, and just a side note: Twisted Metal, the first one, had an amazing soundtrack. Did it really? See, I didn't play. Oh it yeah, I knew it was impressive, oh. like with the three D graphics and things like that for the time. Oh yeah, but it wasn't one that I was actively played a lot. I was more. I remember at that time because it wasn't a lot of games out for the PlayStation One when I had it. Um, but Resident Evil was one that I played more. Oh, but Twisted yeah. Metal was kind of a staple as well, um, and you know, I just didn't really get in. I didn't. See, I didn't even know it had a story. So, yeah. interesting. All right, we got one more to go, brother. <clears throat> this one, we're in and on a bang. It's fascinating. And we've got some footage we'll put up. So, uh, there is a game called Unrecord. Um, and it looks like body cam footage. Now, I am going to warn yeah. you with the video that we put up. It's kind of graphic uh, in that it's, it's using the Unreal Engine 5. Now, we've talked about this before. The Unreal Engine is a game development platform software been around for a very very long time the many many games right now are on unreal engine 4 it's very versatile you can uh make a game that will go on a console on pc you can just it it fast tracks the development of a game creation but the unreal engine 5 is using technology that is so impressive in their demos it looks photo realistic more so than we ever uh, have seen before. The first time I had my hands on the Unreal Engine 5 was when the Matrix uh, movie series, yes. they had released a demo and it it kind of messes with your head. amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, I put it on my PlayStation 5 is what it was on and you just, you can basically walk around the city. It looked so real. Now the character yeah. models did not look that real to me, but the buildings and the cars, it's like you're looking at a photograph or film. Well, Unrecord, is using the Unreal Engine 5 body cam footage. And this footage is of going into what looks like an abandoned warehouse, almost as if you were like a police officer. Um, it is so crazy how real this looks. And a lot of people uh, started to criticize the the developers when they released the trailer saying, you know what, that's recorded footage. This is full motion video. This isn't a game. Well, I think it was a week ago, they actually showed screen cap footage of the game inside of the unreal engine development platform which you can't fake and yep. they were releasing just to prove to people well this is how we're achieving this look we're doing these certain types of shaders we're and you know we're doing all of these different tricks within the engine and it looks so real it's really cool but it shows you where gaming is going with this engine once games are being developed right now in the unreal engine 5 probably within the next year or two you're going to see more of them and where it's going is mind blowing doug what are your thoughts when you saw this footage i mean i would I, my jaw dropped when i saw it oh yeah what do you what do you think about this so i hadn't heard of it and then a friend sent me a message a fellow uh, podcast listener thank you for that but he sent me a message he said hey you guys should really check this out talk about it on your next show i'm like uh, okay i've never heard of it then looking at the screens like you said i thought okay am i watching like live pd or something you know i mean it looks so real and it's crazy technology. So I thought it was a fake at first, like you said, but uh, it's just amazing graphics. A lot of people did. And that's why the developer had to say, look, we're not, this is all in game footage. Yeah. Um, and it is, and I, it makes me wonder where this would go when you put this in a headset for VR, yes. you know, yeah. and then think about the practical applications of training. Uh, think about, I mean, you talk about the level of realism. Um, it's both cool and scary all at once. And then not to mention, if you start throwing in chat GPT AI for language modeling and you, you have this realistic of, 
of footage. It's very, very good. I will say this, the, the, the characters that they're shooting, they do look better than I saw before in the maze. They look more realistic. Um, but I, I notice the engine does best with environments. The environments yeah. look real. You can't tell the difference between a photo uh, and real life footage w- when it comes to actual environments. Um, at some point, we know 3D models of characters are going to catch up to it. We already see it with film. Uh, so it will catch up. But there's going to come to a point where, you know, between deep fake AI, um, then what the Unreal Engine can do, where it's going to be indiscernible between reality uh, and and video games. So that's yeah. the part that's both exciting and scary all at once with this. But this is really, you know, we saw some cool tech demos when the Unreal Engine 5 came out, but it was like rock formations and all this. And I've seen some neat ones with like scuba diver. It looks so real. This was an urban environment. It just, you could have it, thought it was real Oh yeah, footage. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, and I, I've watched a couple of videos on YouTube, but the lighting quality and the textures and the shading mm-hmm. and all those kind of tech terms, I realized it. I mean, I'm not from that industry, but I'm like, oh man, look at the way they did this. Look at the way the sun hits the guy. Uh, it's just yeah. awesome. It's so, a game changer. Like, yeah, this high quality kind of reminds me of, in my law enforcement perspective, we had two things called FATS, F-A-T-S, so Firearms Training Simulator, and Milo Range. So what that is real quick is not uh, VR, um, but it's a uh, projector screen. I'm losing my words okay. here. Projector screen, and it kind of uses lasers. So you, uh, it's real-life video. But they have it to where you shoot your gun that shoots a laser onto the screen, the computer records it, and you can do traffic stops, active shooters, uh, domestics, all kinds of stuff like that. So it's kind of like the arcades, like Mad Dog McCree, you know, the the gun shooters. Way more advanced. So I say that to say that I got to demo a VR headset uh, called Survivor. It's S-U-R-V-I-V-R, kind of a play on words, Survive VR. Mm-hmm. And uh, it uses the PlayStation View headsets, okay. but they had little controllers programmed as flashlights. They had controllers programmed as batons and OC and stuff. But to put that headset on and walk around with my flashlight in the back alleyway is amazing. So if you all haven't checked that out, I'm not trying to give the uh, company like a shout out. Just the way that they're adapting VR technology instead of standing in front of projector screen, but actually what putting yourself in the... Uh, what was the image the, quality like? It was really good. Uh, it was not as good as this at all. I mean, mm-hmm. it was computerized, but it was better than just standing there shooting at a screen. Gotcha. Imagine if but, they, they're they going to integrate. Then you know it's going to happen. They're going to integrate Unreal Engine 5 into a solution Oh, I would like say that. so. Yeah. So, wow. It's fascinating. That, that was a good, good article. Fine. Thank you to your friend. Shout out to them for sending this to you. I did see... Uh, some of the information about it, but I don't know why it just kind of fell through the cracks. So I'm really glad that there was a call out to that. So yeah, good one. All right, man. Let's get into our yeah. main topic. We had a lot of news today. Yeah, we did. It's been uh, good the last couple episodes. <laughs> it has a lot, a lot of a lot of developments. So uh, just a little bit of a background. Um, so w- we attended last weekend. Uh, inside of Columbia, Missouri. I can tell you location. We're going to talk about it. Uh, the Como retro collection video game uh, conference. Now, this is year number two. It has an interesting story as to how this conference got started. Uh, It was started by a 17-year-old named Sumner, and his family was supportive. He wanted to start this, and so they decided to do it. We didn't have anything really in the that area um that's you know for game collectors. I will say I myself, I am not a game collector. Uh, one, I'm, I kind of lean digital. I always have, even when it comes to books, I read on Kindle. Right. Uh, but also space and those kind of things, but I have nostalgia and respect, you know, those that do that, uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of an interesting hobby that a lot of people have. My brother has a massive private collection. It's huge. Uh, the year before, uh, the first year they had it, we, we worked the booth with him and helping sell his, his his collection to kind of thin it out. Um, we did that again this year. So the name of his booth is old timer games. Yeah. And, um, he's, he had a lot of success last year. We decided to get, it was fun because, you know, you get to attend this really cool conference, uh, that's kind of nearby us. 
uh, and see a lot of cool things. So that's what we want to talk about today. And that's kind of the background on it. So Doug, first of all, uh, I know we had Kevin on the the collector last yes. episode is kind of our theme. So it was interesting to talk to him and then to go to this conference uh, and uh, we're working it, of course, uh, but it was really nice continuity. And, and what were your thoughts on this? You, is this your first one that you had done? I know you did it last year, but have you gone to any others? I mean, I know this was my first one that I, the one that I've ever like experienced myself. So what, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, besides working uh, with you and your brother for old timer games, kind of as a volunteer, I have not been to these before. I've been to, you know, garage sales and stuff. And I'm not saying this is garage sale, but it seems similar. Everybody has their little booths and it seemed more like, like a, a swap comic. Meet. Yeah. Swap meet. Yeah. I like a comic con because you had some people and all the t-shirts, they didn't really have costumes, but they, they came for the culture and they came for the atmosphere. And it was really cool for that. It has the same feel as a comic con where everybody has like interest. Uh, what I love working the booth is while I'm not a collector, uh, I, you know, it's nostalgia in that people ask questions and I don't know everything by any means but i love like when they ask a question and then we'll refer you know to each other hey have you heard of this game or this game or that because there's so many games out there and you know it's really neat to kind of share that with someone else i mean like i mentioned earlier my big thing was big box pc games which he was selling yeah. um and i i know a lot about those so it's kind of nice to be able to like share that when somebody comes along like looking for big box pc games and, and i'm able to like help them out or even share cool information like we on the podcast i know, you know there's one guy who uh, he was buying SimCity uh, 2000 and it was on disc. And he said, oh, man, I really wanted the CD version. I'm like, well, we had that, but we sold it. And he's like, and he tells me this story about how he has all these memories about playing SimCity 2000 on his you know, DOS machine. And I tell him, I'm like, well, you can play it now. You can buy this and collect it because I know you're a collector, but you know you can use DOSBox, which is an emulator. So I told him about it, told him how to do it. And I don't know, it just it's kind of cool to be able to share uh, those kind of stories of people that come to the booth, see all the cool T-shirts. Uh, and then they also have celebrity guests there. Doug, I know you got a chance to walk around and talk to uh, some people, specifically the guests that they had there that were the, I guess you want to call them celebrity guests. Like who, who was it you talked to and what was that like? Yeah, uh, there were quite a few people, a couple um, uh, kind of famous collectors uh, that have some YouTube channels, uh, Retro Tony, Retro Mikey, um, uh, I've watched some of their videos. They're really big on collecting. They're the guys that, you know, have the list and they're trying to complete, uh, certain systems and, uh, collections. Um, now the other guys that, uh, interest me were Adam Korlick and Paul Niemeyer. So Adam Korlick was there last year. He had what I believe was called a Pluto. Saturn Pluto. Yeah. Yeah. It's a or a Sega Pluto. Yeah. Sega. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, really cool system, um, prototype, you know, you, you and I have talked. I didn't know what that was. You told me, I believe, that uh, it's a prototype. It won't have very many games for it, but it's just such a unique item, and it's very, very rare. Yeah, there's so only I, two, and he has one of them. Two and two that it survived. I think they only made a small batch of them. And the thing about Adam is his YouTube channel is he is like the Sega historian. This dude knows yeah. so much about Sega tons of knowledge in that space check out his channel yeah. if you haven't had an opportunity to do so but he takes this pluto uh and he takes it around the world and he shows people it and it's 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 pretty cool so it's kind of neat that he was there yeah it, he is a wealth of knowledge i sit there and talk to him for a little bit and i also got to see that pluto again that thing is just so weird looking we could try to throw a photo up uh, for everybody here yep uh, the other guy, I kind of in relation to the con was having a Mortal Kombat tournament. Uh, they brought in Paul Niemeyer, who is the original artist for the first Mortal Kombat. Uh, and there's some controversy there. He's got some videos online. It's kind of some intellectual property issues. But beside that point, the art that he made and the signs and the banners for the arcades, just amazing. Uh, the guy is very talented. Yeah, for the actual arcade cabinets as well. Yes. Uh, I know I've seen interviews with him about, um, he talks about the process and what they had to go through. I mean, obviously this is pre-Photoshop. Um, you know, they'd come up with the artwork and then how they had to go through and, and manufacture it for the actual cabinets and 
fascinating, fascinating uh, story in yeah. person. So, you know, not sure if we would be able to, would love to be able to snag having some of these people on. I, I know I had ran into a curator for uh, a mobile video game museum. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's really cool. I think they only had a fraction of the uh, items that they have uh, inside of that collection, but they take it on the road. They're based out of, I think, Oklahoma, and they show you really cool things like, you know, uh, original items, uh, original Game Boys or prototypes, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of neat. They had really, really cool vendors there, uh, not just selling uh, like what we were doing to help, but, you know, to showcase and again, just to share uh, in that commonality of, of video gaming uh, and that sort of thing. Yep. We saw Kevin well, could, too. We did, yeah. He uh, said he found a couple things, bought a couple things. Um, I believe his NES collection is where he wants. And talking to him in the past, he's kind of trying to downgrade a little bit. Got some uh, family uh, expansion going on, so a little yep. different priorities yep. nowadays. That's understandable, but it's really cool to make that connection after getting to to talk with him and and then see him there as well. Uh, but overall, you know. This is a, a really cool thing, and uh, it's it grew from last year. I think uh, targets they had, like last year they achieved, you know, 300 plus people. Uh, mm -hmm. When talking to those that were putting it on, the parents of, of the young man that put it on, they were targeting about, they think they had over 500 attend this year. They had more vendors this year, uh, a little bit larger space. They want to kind of not make it too big. They don't want it to grow too out of control. Uh, but you know, overall success, more power yes. to them. I think it's awesome that they were able to get all the people in. Uh, it was a fun time, a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, yeah. we sold a lot of stuff, uh, in helping, uh, with our booth, uh, but it was really cool. You know, we were there, we were uh, handing out stickers and cards for our podcast. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, we were wearing our shirts, you know, and just as a, as a plug here, you know, look at Doug got me for an upcoming birthday I have here. Yeah. So it's a good, good plug. If you're not, if you're only listening, I'm holding up a, uh, a Tumblr that has the Wired Nerdy logo on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were able to get our merch store up right before going to this convention as well uh, and, and be able to promote not only a podcast to increase our base, but again, we're not strictly a podcast that's about retro game collection. We're no. we're wired nerdy. We anything nerd, but it falls definitely in our umbrella of category, which we're we're you know we're tech and movies and film and comic books. But video games are a huge part of that, uh, and so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for us to uh, expand our brand uh, and hand out cards. So hopefully, we're able to increase some listenership, and so we really appreciate uh, being able to work the booth, being able to help out. Um, I mean, overall, man, like it'll be interesting to see if this continues moving forward. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? Where, where do you see this whole thing going? And, you know, does it make you want to go to other ones or like what, you know, what do you want to start doing video game collecting <laughs> hopping? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts and I could be wrong, but I think once we see PlayStation six, Xbox, maybe whatever the next one's called you know they've had some different yeah. names uh so the next generation of consoles that's a better way to say it once they get rid of that uh, cd drive disc drive completely uh, then it'll be digital media only i think these uh collections and these cons will be so much better because now you're looking for physical media that's not even made anymore and i like that uh there's such a strong following for all the way back to the Atari and some of the more obscure things like the 3DO and Coleco, uh, <laughs> Coleco and all those that we've never yeah. heard of. It's cool to go see those, but it's cool that there's a following of people that say, you know, this is old. It doesn't look the best. It's really blocky little characters, but I love it. I've had so many memories of it. So I think yeah. it'll get better. I'm kind of wrap up my conversation, but better once we go digital only and people want to go back to that uh, hard uh, media format. Yeah. And I just had this conversation recently with my brother uh, in that, you know, you can see where it's going. Obviously PC steam's already done it. Uh, there are a lot of rumors about the next PlayStation and the next Xbox about where they won't have an integrated optical disc drive, but maybe an add on USB type drive uh, so that you can, you know, play some backward compatibility 
specifically that's why a lot of people uh, wanted the uh, playstation 5 with the optical yeah. drive because it can play ps4 uh, games as well which is cool you know we settled on when my brother and i were going back and forth on it we actually had a really cool idea on it and that it would be really neat because it, it's interesting to point out partially why we're stepping away from physical media is well obviously there's overhead to companies to create that and then publish it artwork yep. distribution game stops as we talked about in prior episodes are going away best buy is already struggling so you're forced online uh the other aspect of it isn't just the business side of it and overhead uh, but we're starting to reach limitations on storage and read write speeds for optical and Nintendo is very unique in that they've stuck with a, a cartridge. It's basically like an SD cartridge. And where my brother and I landed on, it'd be kind of neat. And I don't know if they'll do this, but as they walk away from optical media, it would be cool for uh, these, at least for consoles, because PC, they've already, they're done with the optical media. It's all Steam all the way. It's yeah. its origin. Yeah. It's, you know, the Ubisoft store. It's, it's all of those. Uh, but it would be neat for the consoles to integrate at least a slot for an SD card and maybe if you know developers were to say okay well we're going to release primarily on digital but we'll have a, a limited run uh of, which is a company called limited run that does this actually but they would do a limited run or a limited manufacturing of uh, those cards physical media release because then if you do it on the cards you're circumventing the read write speeds because you can read and write faster on those cards because it's, it's a solid state uh and then also uh, you know, it it shouldn't cost a lot of money uh, to to produce. Uh, and in fact, they should charge a premium for it so that, you know, they're already charging freaking insane amount of money, even on digital, which I don't agree with 70 bucks for a digital download. If they charge you an extra 10 bucks for, you know, to, to cover the overhead for the collectors, mm -hmm. that would be neat. Now, I don't know if that will happen on the console side. Uh, I doubt it because digital is kind of the trend and where it's going. But you are right in that I do think that depending on what happens in the gaming industry and there's a pivot uh, over to digital media, I do think it'll make these retro conventions um, uh, more popular. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think that it'll impact the pricing, collecting prices, things will be more rare. But this isn't that much different to me than what we're seeing what's going on with movie theaters and streaming, which streaming disrupted, obviously, movie theaters and then COVID didn't help. Uh, you're seeing the same thing when it comes to uh, these video games and distribution. So I will be interested to see how collecting moves forward uh, in the next 10 years, for sure. Yep, I uh, agree completely. So it'll be uh, interesting. I know we've talked in the past, there's something about getting a physical copy with the books and uh, maps and Nostalgic. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sad not to get that anymore. It is. There's something lost in that, um, in that, you know, we've had the same conversations. I've had this with my daughter. She prefers to read books, paper, tangible, yeah. touch it. I get that. That's awesome. Me, I like the Kindle. Uh, I've had the same conversation about comic books. Comic books are going digital as well, but yet they're still printing them on paper. People still prefer paper because of the yeah. color. And again, there's pros and cons to both. It's more about what will people gravitate, gravitate towards to buy. Uh, and that's the same for each one of these. I mean, people as a collective consciousness, they're already buying from Amazon more so than they are big box stores. That's why you see big, you know, Best Buy's closing and and companies having to change up their games and tactics. It's no different when it comes to the video game market or film market or book market. All of these forms of entertainment are being impacted by the disruption of digital. So it'll be interesting uh, to see how all this thing plays out. But I had a great time. I hope you had a good time. Yep. Um, yep. We'll see if they'll do it again next year. We, we hope to show up. I uh, love connecting with people. Love seeing all the cool t-shirts. Uh, yep. Love seeing all of the old games. Talk about walking down memory lane. There's some games I forgot about. I'd be like, oh, wow, I did play that. You know, Or discovering games that I didn't even know existed before and I want to add to my back catalog and get. Yes. So it's always fun yeah. for that. Really good time. All right, brother. Well, I think we are at the top of our time. Uh, we hope to put out feelers to maybe have some guests on, uh, yeah. in the future. Uh, I know we had some conversations. You talked with, uh, Adam Korlick, you talked with Paul, uh, Nehmeyer. uh, hopefully, you know, we're going to reach out yeah. to them. Maybe we can I get them so. on our, our little humble podcast here. I think they have yeah. some awesome stories and, uh, some stuff that they could tell us, uh, that we would share. And that's really what we're, we're all about here. So that 
wraps up episode number 13. We want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been fun doing this. We're still having a blast. Thanks for hanging with us. Tell your friends, tell your family. Go check out our website, which will be in the description yeah. of both the YouTube and on uh, each one of the streaming services now. And that website can also lead you to our merch store if you want to get a, a cool little mug like the one you know I'm holding up here or a cool little t-shirt. Uh, yeah. Feel free to go out there and snag it. Doug, take us home, man. Close it out. Yeah, just uh, thank you everybody for listening to this uh, or watching this or a combination of both there. Um, like I said, the merch store, go out to help us out. Uh, we're not making money. We're just two friends having fun. This is just paying all these uh, silly fees and stuff. We got to do the platform and the uploading. Uh, so thanks again to all our loyal fans. Keep listening. We'll keep bringing good stuff. And don't uh, be afraid to leave us a comment. Tell us what you want us to cover. Tell us what you want us to talk about. And we'll cover it in the future. That's a great point. I love the suggestions that we're getting from listeners when they find something because we can't find everything. No. Uh, I love that. So definitely throw it in the con, you know, in the comments on YouTube or whatever your services, uh, and feel free to reach out to us and we will we'll we'll go over it. Everyone, take care. Have an awesome week, and we will talk to you next episode.